Morning, my name is Rick Mikesell and I am here again to talk about warm water opportunities for the spring and upcoming summer. Uh, today we're gonna talk about my probably favorite species to catch on a fly rod and that is carp. Carp on the fly is an entirely visual, super exciting, very challenging game. It's the closest to saltwater fishing you can get in freshwater. And quite frankly, carp are harder to fool than most tarpon and bonefish. Definitely not permit, but that's a different story. Uh, carp fishing is abundant. It's close to home. I can walk out the back of the shop and go fishing after work. I can drive five to 10 minutes from my home and find really high quality carp fishing. And that holds true for most of the country. They are prevalent in every state in the union except for Alaska. They are a absolute blast to catch on the fly rod. And because they're so challenging, even for accomplished anglers, it still keeps you coming back because you get your butt kicked quite often. So let's talk a little bit about gear. In the previous warm water segments, uh, sometimes the quality of the gear from a strength standpoint wasn't super important. We know pike don't go on long runs. We know largemouth bass just thrash around. Carp really put gear to the test, and this is where high quality equipment does come into play because the worst possible thing you can do is spend money on a rod or reel, a fly line, leader, and tippet, lose your first fish that eats or break a rod or break a reel. They will test your gear. So you do have to pay attention to what you're buying. Uh, the really inexpensive or sourced overseas stuff may not cut it. So as we have in the past, let's start with rods and reels. And we'll do the same format, kind of a good, better, best, and let you know how you can get started chasing carp on the fly while not necessarily breaking the bank. There's some great value options out there. So for carp on the fly, your sweet spot as far as rod size is a nine foot six or a nine foot seven weight. The six weight is a little lighter to cast. It's a little more sporty. It's great for lakes and ponds where you're not fighting current. It's also great for shoulder seasons in the river when the fish aren't at their peak metabolism and they're not making the biggest runs just to keep it nice and fun. Quite frankly, you don't need both, but it is nice to have that seven weight for really big fish or big water or fast current, things that the fish is gonna really stress the rod. Um, but the six weight is perfectly capable of landing those fish, it's just a little more sporty. So the most budget friendly option that I think I would recommend is the TFO Blue Ribbon. And the Blue Ribbon is a new series from TFO. It's a really beautiful rod. It's got a nice burgundy wrap and cocoa brown blank, uh, composite fighting butt, and you do need a fighting butt in carp rods because you will be fighting them for a long time. It takes away some of that fatigue when it's locked around the forearm, or you can really plant it in your belly and, and fight them hard. Um, Really nice fit and finish. TFO has done an excellent job of making a very high performing, good looking rod at a reasonable price. And we've been really happy having them in the shop for folks that want to augment their quiver without breaking the bank. So really, really good to starting place if you're looking for a carp or even a still water rod. To pair with that, uh, this is the TFO NTR, the no tools required. This is a machined aluminum, fully sealed carbon drag. Quality of the reel in carp fishing is important. These fish will test your drag much like saltwater species. You will see backing quite often and unsealed drags that aren't super efficient or thermoplastic drags that can heat up and melt. Anything that's maybe okay with trout will get tested in the carp world. So having something that's machined aluminum so it can take a beating and something with a capable drag, carbon or cork, is really important. The TFO is very moderately priced. It's well designed, it's fairly lightweight, but still is substantial enough that if you drop it, it's not gonna bend or break. It's got a nice large arbor for quick pickup ratio. It's a really good value in a machined aluminum drag reel. In kind of that middle of the road, 
This is my personal Loomis IMX Pro. And the IMX Pro is probably the best value in fly rods, in American-made fly rods. G Loomis did a, an excellent job in designing this rod. It's quick enough to have the power you need to load. It's quick enough to make quick casts and get the fly moving for those fast shots. It's a little stripped down as compared to the higher end Loomis rods. The real seat is fairly bare bones, but the cork is nicely appointed. It's good quality, it's utilitarian. Uh, it looks good and it fishes even better. This rod has landed infinite fish and it just keeps going. It's got lots of power for the fight, lots of power for the cast. I use it in still water all the time for trout. It's a great value in that middle of the road rod. For a mid price point reel, this is the new Hardy Ultra Disc. And we just brought Hardy into the shop this year and we've been really impressed. They've designed reels longer than anybody on the planet. They've been doing it in England since the 1800s. They know how to design a reel and they're doing a great job with their modern reels as well. This again is a fully sealed carbon drag. It's machine bar stock aluminum. It's got a huge arbor. So when a fish runs and takes a ton of line, you can get it back very quickly. Nice and smooth, maintenance free. Um, not much not to like about these reels. They're, they're a great value and they're not going to break the bank like the next reel we're going to talk about. And that's the new Able Rove. This one is a pretty pricey reel, but this is the reel that all of us in the shop walk by and stare, on the stare at on the wall daily. It is gorgeous. It is well designed. It sounds good. It feels good. This reel, um, won a bunch of awards at this year's IFTD show for quite a few reasons. So it's based on the same cork disc platform that the Able Supers have been based on forever. The Able Super was the standard in saltwater fly fishing for most of the history of fly fishing. The cork is reliable so long as you keep it clean and keep it lubricated, it will bounce back and perform day in and day out forever. You can hand this reel down to your son, you can hand it down to your daughter, they can hand it down to their grandkids. This is an heirloom quality reel. Like all Ables, it's machined to the highest level of precision. It's hand polished. Every detail is taken into an account and it performs, like I said, day in, day out. The best part about this reel is the sound and feel of it, particularly when you're fighting a fish. There's nothing like a cork drag in your hands, the, the chunk and clunk of the fight. Even though it's very smooth, you still have that feel of the cork engaging, the feel of the line going out, and that really nice auditory click, just hearing that fish take off with your line. It's a ton of fun, and if you have the money, they're absolute works of art. To pair with that Able Rove, if you want the pick of the litter from fly rods this is my trusty orvis helios nine foot seven weight 3d you've seen this rod in the previous warm water talks this is my go-to warm water bass carp sometimes pike um, wiper all kinds of species it's insanely lightweight it's insanely accurate it loads very quickly has a ton of reserve power fights fish well doesn't cause arm fatigue is beautifully appointed the Helios 3D is a lot of our in the shops go-to, and if you have the money to spend on it, it will be your go-to as well. It won't let you down. So the nice thing about carp fishing is you don't honestly need a ton of gear. You don't need huge bags to carry multiple boxes. You don't need split shot or bobbers. You don't need infinite spools of tippet. Really, you just need your rod, your reel, your pack, um, some specific wearables that we'll talk about here in a minute, and flies. The fly line is extraordinarily straightforward. We're not talking about sinking lines. We're not talking about specialized lines. All you need is a good quality floating line that's appropriate for your rod and isn't in a very bright color. So carp do see in true color, similar to the way that we see in true color, not shades of gray like a lot of other freshwater fish species. 
So if you have a bright orange or a bright neon green fly line, and you're not so great with your cast that you have to have multiple false casts, that bright orange or bright green flash overhead could potentially spook them. So the only consideration I would make in fly line is something that is durable and something that's a muted color. As noted in previous warm water talks, my go-to for most of these faster action rods is the Scientific Angler's Amplitude Infinity Taper. And this specifically is the camo. So the camo has a alternating olive and kind of burnt sienna tip that creates a more natural color that's not gonna spook the fish. Being an amplitude line, it's extraordinarily durable. It picks up off the water really nice. It shoots to the guides really nice. And the Infinity Taper with a little bit longer belly is great for um, making sure you can carry lines. So if the fish changes direction, you can pick up the whole head and put it right back down in one false cast. So we don't need to look at 10, 15 different lines, different tapers, different sink rates, a good quality floating line that's durable and matches your fly rod. That's all you need in the fly line world. So for the fly to fly line connection, leader and tippet, it's really simple, really, really simple. You need a nine foot, 16 pound fluorocarbon leader. Fluorocarbon is important in carp fishing for two reasons. One, most of the places that carp live are fairly urban and there's lots of sharp hazards, concrete, rebar, all kinds of things that can nick monofilament. And two, most of our presentations are going to have to get down to the substrate as quick as possible. Fluorocarbon sinks, so fluorocarbon is a better option for that. If you don't have fluorocarbon, you can make mono work, but fluorocarbon is definitely going to perform better. To the end of your fluorocarbon leader, you'll attach a foot to two feet of fluorocarbon tippet. Nine times out of 10, I'm using 16 pound. 16 pound is kind of the sweet spot because it is strong enough that it's very difficult, very, very difficult for you to break off while fighting the fish so long as your knots are good. But it is breakable enough that we can exert enough pressure if we get snagged or hang up somewhere that we need to break our fly off that we can actually break it. Once you get into the 20 pound and above world, it's very difficult to intentionally break off that fly. You'll end up breaking fly lines, breaking rods, things get kind of bad. So 16 pound is that sweet spot. I do carry a spool of 12 pound as well, just in case the, it's very rare that they spook on leader and tippet. Um, I'm not super concerned with the diameter of, or size like it would be in trout, um, but I have 12 just in case I'm fishing lighter flies or um, I need it for some reason to size down. Pretty rare, I mean, this spool is still almost full. I like the Umqua or Scientific Anglers fluorocarbon from Umqua. It's the Deceiver HD from Scientific Anglers. It's the Absolute or Absolute Supreme. These are all coated fluorocarbons, so they're very durable. Um, they're quite frankly stronger than any fluorocarbon of the past. They're pretty impressed with how hard I have to work to break these off. So. Whether it's SA or Umqua, you can't go wrong. Nine foot, 16 pound fluorocarbon leader and 12 or 16 pound fluorocarbon tippet directly to your fly, you're ready to fish. No bobbers, no split shot, no fancy tag ends. Single fly, very easy, straightforward rig. As to flies, my personal opinion on flies, and I have friends that are very accomplished carp fishermen that catch just as many, if not more than me, that have different opinions. But my opinion on fly is that it doesn't really matter that much as far as pattern is concerned. If it looks like something that a carp has eaten in the past, that's present in the ecosystem, that's reasonable for them to eat, and you present it well to a happy fish, a happy eating fish, they're gonna eat it. The one important part about flies that we need to consider is weight. And here in the Denver South Platte River, we have a current. And most of the fish when they're feeding are feeding off the substrate tailing. And you need to get that fly down in front of the fish in their tiny little feeding window as quick as possible. 
So having a heavily weighted fly that we can present without being super splashy near the fish via the drag and drop. And you can check out uh, the multiple previous videos we've done on drag and drop and carp presentation. Um, we present past the fish, we lift it up in the water column, we drag it across, we let it gently fall via the weight of the fly in that limited feeding zone. And at that point, the fish nine times a 10, out of 10 either eats or spooks. So this box here is all my heavy flies. Uh, just to highlight some of my favorites, uh, the Umpqua Tungsten Jig Bugger. This thing is clutch. It works great. This is the peacock in black color. It jigs when you give it a little twitch if you need to. It also is a great smallmouth pattern. This is Daryl Angler's Nervous Waters Flies Detroit Mop City. This will be an Umpqua signature pattern in 2023. This is a hybrid of a mop and a traditional barbell eye carp fly. Plenty of weight, moves great, fish love to eat it. And then the classic, the guy who started it all, Mr. Barry Reynolds, Barry's Carp Fly. This river was, excuse me, this fly was developed to catch fish in current on the Denver South Platte River. It serves as a crayfish, could be a leech, could be a bunch of different food sources. Super impressionistic. One important thing about carp flies is they need to have materials that move on their own. We're not stripping the fly at most. The only action we're giving it when it's in the pocket is just a subtle little twitch. So these flies need to have materials that undulate and flex and flow. You want the fish to be able to discern that it's food from all the other stuff in the substrate. So the important thing about all these flies is they have marabou or hen saddle or in some cases rubber legs that will move on their own without us imparting any action in them. So that's really important in the river is to have some movement and weight. As we move on to still water, we don't have to fight the current. So we have the luxury of a little bit slower sinking patterns. We also have fish that are eating in the surface film. They're clooping, they're sucking flies down from the substrate. It's pretty rare that they actually will eat as in a trout sense, a dry fly. Um, if they break the surface, they'll take air into their swim bladder and that will affect their buoyancy. And they'll either have to release or take in more air to move up and down in the water column. So most of the time when you see them on the surface feeding, they're just below sucking down and never breaking the surface film. So for those type of fish, I like to use um, just good old fashioned yarn eggs or from Daryl Angler, he has a really great pattern called the hipster doofus. This will also be an Umqua signature pattern in 2023. It's got this great CDC soft tackle, a nice light body, and a little bit of bead chain just to bring it down just below the surface. So you can just hang it in that top part of the column and watch those cloopers suck it in. For the fish that are tailing in still water, same idea as the river, just a little bit lighter. You don't need those super heavy flies to get down because you're not fighting the current. So a smaller lead eye, the little bit of lead wrap can get it down quickly. This is Jay Zimmerman's classic backstabber. It could be a leech, could be a crayfish. It has a great sink rate. It moves in the water. Um, it's also a really good trout fly. You'd be surprised at how many trout you can catch on that. And then the other important fly to talk about is the worm. So in fisheries where there are a lot of aquatic worms or in rivers where there's flushes, big rainstorms, big flow increases, just like in the trout world, worms will get washed in. Worms are wiggly balls of protein and carp want to eat them. But your good old fashioned San Juan worm isn't gonna cut it. Um, Carp do not let food drift to them. They are much like bonefish where they're seeking out food and pulling it. Prey never swims towards a predator. So if a fly was to ever move towards a carp in a nymph style, it would spook them. It needs to move away. So the worms that we're fishing are tied in that carp style. Head stand, uh, barbell or bead chain eyes down, and then they have some type of buoyant tail that pops up and wiggles. So this is Trevor Tanner's perennial McLovin. Um, I'm sorry, this is the trouser worm. Uh, this is all little foam stacks and it just wiggles in the current because this foam is buoyant and it pops up. 
And this is a new fly for us at Trout's, the Luggy from Rainey's. It has this big rubber worm tail. Again, lead barbell eyes to get it down. And this rubber tail just sits there and wiggles. And that's all the action you need to entice a feeding carp. I have lots and lots of flies. To be frank, the only time I'm ever changing flies is if I get refused by two or three fish. Nine times out of 10, it's presentation over pattern. So you don't need this many flies. This is a collection amassed over 20 years of doing this. There are specific places that I like specific nuanced bugs, colors, things like that. But that's something for you to have fun exploring, figuring out those little subtle nuances in the grand scheme and at the highest level, if you find a fish that's actively feeding and you put a fly that kind of looks like something they eat in front of them and present it well, you're most of the time going to get an eat. So don't overthink fly like you would in trout. You don't need to match the hatch. You don't need a size 22 and a half blueing olive to match the size 22 and a half blueing olives that are hatching. Make it look like food, they'll eat it. So kind of some accessories to round out your needs. This is my cart pack. This is the Umqua Bandolier Sling. Um, it's perfect size for cart fishing. I keep it in the back of my car. It's lightweight. It holds everything I need. It's comfortable. I can put my net between my pack and the back and hold it comfortably. It's a really good value. It's under a hundred bucks. It's got a nice fly drying patch here where you can keep all the flies you've changed out. Bomber pack, inexpensive. It comes in camo, which we talked a lot about the color perception of carp. So you'll see a lot of camo on the table. We'll talk about that in a second. Really, really awesome pack. As far as tools are concerned, you need a good pair of nippers to cut line. These are my trusty Able nippers. Um, if you go back through our YouTube channel, you'll see a long-term review that was a long time ago. So it's a double long-term review. I mean, I think I've had this pair for 11 or 12 years now. They still cut every single time. They are not available from Able any longer. They have a new improved model coming out at the end of this month. We are anxiously awaiting the new Able nippers. Able, please give us the new Able nippers. They will be just as good quality, if not better. The blade still will be better. The ergonomics would be better. So stay tuned for the new Able nippers. And then, of course, we need a pair of hemostats to get the fly out of their mouth. This is the new uh, regulator hemo from Scientific Anglers. It's got a cutter if you don't want to carry a pair of nippers. The nippers can get a little bit closer to trim tag ends, but the cutter works just fine. They're easy to hold in your hand. They have this nice angle, so if you have to tuck up into the projectile mouth of a carp, they get up there without being obtrusive. They're springy and bounce back. They have comfy grips. Um, SA did a really great job with these hemos. We're, we're really happy to have them. And then on to gear for your person. Besides having a capable rod and the right flies, the other two most important pieces of gear are a large landing net and really good polarized sunglasses. Carp are big. The average fish in the Denver South Platte River is eight to nine pounds. There are specimens over 20 pounds. They will not fit in your tiny little trout net. You will blow up bags, you will break wooden nets, you will smash carbon fiber nets. You need a big, strong net to keep these fish corralled. So as always, I have my trusty aluminum American-made rising net. Um, this is the first generation. They've actually made some inline improvements to newer models, but this thing besides changing out the bag maybe once every 18 to 24 months, you can't beat it. And the bag is really easy to change out. I have the extra deep bag on here, which you can buy as an add-on. So I can fit those really big 34, 35 inch, potentially 20 pound carp in my net without them blowing through. It's sturdy aluminum. It's not gonna bend, it's not gonna break. It's got a big bag. It's got measuring marks on the bag so you can measure how long the fish is. Um, pretty tough to beat that net. Most of us in the shop are using rising nets just because we don't have to worry about them. Day in, day out, they bounce back. And then, like I noted, cart fishing is a 100% sight fishing endeavor. So good pair of high quality polarized sunglasses. 
We're big fans of Bahio. Um, this is the Gates model. Don't be super concerned about what model you get. You want a model that fits your face and blocks out light. So there's not a better or a worse model. The models are going to be dependent on your face shape. So find one that blocks out light from underneath the eye, above the cheekbone, and from behind the eye. That's a big one. If you're standing with the sun at your back and there's a gap between your face and the outside of the lens and that sunlight hits the back of the lens, it's going to scramble back off and reflect and give you some eye strain and give you a headache at the end of the day. So make sure they're a good fitting pair. And for carp fishing and most freshwater sight fishing, try to get as light of a lens as you're comfortable with. Um, the mirrored finish is really nice because it does reduce UV while still giving you a lighter base. These are a copper base, a brown base, and they're a great all-around pair. The violet or pink lenses are really great as well, a little bit better in lower light, and the mirrored finish will bounce back a lot of that blue light and harmful UV and keep your eyes comfortable as you're trying to stare through the water all day. The last thing to note is what you're wearing. Um, as I noted, carp are very spooky. They can see color. They're really good at movement detection at distance. So anything you can do to avoid spooking them by what you are doing as you're fishing is really important. And I am of the camp that camo makes a big difference. And when I personally go carp fishing, I wear camo. So. Here's some offerings. We have some really cool Trouts branded Sims caps and Trouts branded Indian caps in camo patterns. And then my go-to for a day on the water is some type of camo Sims Solar Flex or Solar Vent hoodie. It's summertime, it's hot, having the hood to block light out from the back and also cover your neck, keeping you from getting sunburned. They breathe. Uh, they don't stink. You don't get really sweaty in them. They're comfortable. Uh, this is pretty much standard issue, the Solar Flex hoodie for fishing these days. Just get one in camo so the fish don't see you. Um, if you haven't already, check out our YouTube page for previous videos we've done on Chasing Carp on the Fly. They go into technique, they go into reading water, they go into presentation, they go into hooking and landing fish. It is a challenging pursuit, but it's a really rewarding pursuit when you put in the time to do it right. And it's convenient, it's close, the fish are big, they pull, drag, you'll see backing. It is about as much fun as you can have in fresh water. As always, if you have questions, uh, give us a call, send us an email. We love talking about this stuff. And if you're here locally in Colorado and you want to learn how to do this in person, check out our event calendar. We do have carp schools coming up throughout the summer once a month that you can get out on the river with Barry Reynolds and myself, and we'll teach you the ins and outs and everything that we know that we can teach you in a day about carp fishing. Or Barry and I also do private guided trips on the river. So give us a shout. We'd love to show you the bounty of the Denver South Platte River, the magic of catching carp on the fly, and we look forward to seeing you on the water this summer. Thanks so much.